So um, this picture here uh, is a typical suburban backyard situation. The next picture is our friend um, Ron and uh, Vicki uh, up in uh, Downers Grove. Their last name is Nowicki. This is their backyard. Look at how beautiful that is. Our backyards can be highly productive and very beautiful. On the left-hand side there, you can see this kind of this vining thing. That's actually a winter hardy kiwi, and it grows so well. You know, he has to slash it back every year. And uh, I was there one fall when the kiwis were coming in, and uh, my gosh, they're not the they're not your normal kiwi with all the hairy fuzz on them. They're uh, like the size of a small plum, and they're smooth-skinned. And you just pop one into your mouth, and it's just absolutely delicious. So we can all grow winter, winter hardy kiwi. And we can all make our backyards and our front yards beautiful. Just because we're growing food doesn't mean it has to be in rows and be really ugly looking. Picture 76 is of village homes. This is an example of a community that designed was designed permaculturally. All the water uh, is collected in swales, so they harvest the rainwater. They get 18 inches of rain. This is Davis, California, by the way. This is right up next to the University of um, California there. And um, um, so they harvest the rainwater. They're able to grow trees. They have fruit trees, and they have a, a vineyards. Um, everywhere you go in the community, we'll, you'll see a short film uh, about this uh, at your course. Uh, there's fruit growing everywhere. But what is significant, they put an almond crop in. This is California. They put an almond crop in, and the almond crop belongs to the entire community. They have a farmer that they pay to harvest it, but the profits from that harvesting operation go to the community to help cover maintenance costs on other areas of the community. So there's no reason every community couldn't be full of food and actually producing a, crash, a cash crop for the citizens. Um, we did a design course last uh, fall. Uh, Wayne and I uh, taught one in Grass Valley, and uh, one day we took our students, we took them down to uh, Davis. We wanted them to see Village Homes. And I was looking at this hedge here and just thinking, uh, I was actually was looking at the gardens and noticing the hedge, and uh, Wayne says, hey, Bill, take a look at this, and he pulls back a branch. Look at slide 78. That's a pomegranate. Um, that's a hedge that they've made into what looks like a very traditional-looking hedge, but it's growing food at the same time. The next picture shows Wayne on top of a house. This is a roof. Matter of fact, uh, in the film that we show you, uh, Bill Mollison is standing in the exact same place 20 years earlier, so you'll be able to see a before and after shot of that. And I wanted to share this little snippet with you as well. The next slide, um, slide 80, this looks like a very traditional suburban environment, doesn't it? Houses and cars and streets and same old, same old. 20 years ago, some um, two neighbors decided to take the fence down between their house. They both had children, and they decided to kind of cooperatively take care of their kids and grow food and kind of created this nice situation between their two households. And then the house behind them, on the op opposite street, but behind them, um, became available. And they decided, let's buy that house. We'll rent it out to college students. This is also Davis, California. We'll rent it out to college students. We'll take that fence down, and then we'll invite whoever rents that space to kind of join in, you know, this kind of community process that we're setting up. But if nothing else, we'll use their backyard to do gardening as well. Well, over a period of 20 years, they formed a, a cooperative, an association. It's called, look at the next slide, the N Street Co-Housing Unit, or co cooperative. And they ended up buying every house on the block. The cooperative owns all the houses. Everybody rents their house from the cooperative. They took down all the fences. And if you look at the next several pictures, they turned it all into patios and garden areas. They've got a meeting room. They have a patio area that they can all meet. Um, there's gardens left. There's gardens right. There's food everywhere. They have a grassy area that they kept in there, so you know you can play croquet or kids can run around. You can run your dog or walk your dog. But uh, slide 86, I really got a kick out of this. You see all the telephone wires in there. That's the very middle of the block. This is where the alley used to be, all right? This is where this mulberry tree is now. There's no alley anymore. And you got all these wires running through. But there's this massive, probably a 50-foot tall mulberry tree loaded with berries. And I noticed that there was a fence with grapes on it all the way around the base of the tree, you know, about where the drip line is. So I went over there and I uh, looked behind the fence to see what was on the inside of the fence and look at what I found the next slide. Chickens. You see any mulberries on the ground? Not a one. 
they're harvesting every single mulberry off of that tree because when it lands on the ground, it goes into the chicken and it creates some of the richest, reddest yolk eggs that you'll ever eat. And so they're taking this bountiful crop. Those of you who've harvested mulberries or eat mulberry know that, you know, you can harvest a lot of them, but you can't harvest all of them. There's just way too many of them, and they're too hard to get to. And uh, so anything that ends up in the ground still ends up in an egg, and they get to get the benefit of it. Uh, next slide, a uh, picture of Enright Ridge Echo Village. This is a group of folks in uh, Cincinnati that are doing the very same thing. Uh, slowly but surely, they're... Um, uh, purchasing uh, houses along this block. This block, this neighborhood is over 100 years old. These are old buildings, and they're slowly converting them, making them energy efficient, taking down the fences, and they're creating a really strong neighborhood experience there, uh, cooperatively doing all kinds of things. What this means to me is it doesn't matter what neighborhood we live in, whether it's in the city, whether it's in an apartment building, whether it's in the suburbs, we can turn our any of those environments into very uh, positive productive uh, community environments that provide us for, with food and with safety and with community. And on the energy feature here, uh, slide 89, here's a picture of Stephen and Rebecca Wren. They wrote this great book, just came out this year, The Carbon-Free Home. And it's a perfect example of, you know, rather than building this perfect house, you know, 30 miles out in the country and having five acres, matter of fact, they did this. And they had in, they were on the cover of you know Solar Magazine 1993 or something like that. The perfect couple, the perfect house, and it was straw bale, it was energy free, and all this kind of stuff. And then they measured their carbon footprint every time they wanted to go to work, every time they wanted to, or didn't want to go to work, uh, every time they wanted to see friends, any time they wanted to shop, they had to drive to town. And the carbon footprint of all that driving was a massive amount of energy. So they ended up selling that dream home. And besides, they didn't even have community. After a while, they just said, why are we out here by ourselves? Let's go back to town. They bought a 75-year-old house. They spent quite a bit of time and money retrofitting this house to the point where now they, they're calling it carbon-free because they're generating all the energy that they need to run their household. Now, it cost a good buck. It took a while to get it to that point. The point is it is possible. Uh, what's their ROI? What's their return on investment? Uh, they didn't do it for that reason. But you can be sure that in the coming years, when the price of energy starts really going nuts, they're way ahead of the game. And when all of us decide to make our homes energy efficient at the same time, and all of us want solar panels, and all of us want to do all these different things to make our, ener our homes energy efficient, the price of doing all that is going to go way up too. So now's a good time to do it.